Good morning. Amen. Well, we're up to session five or part five of the right way in, and uh, and this week we're looking at um, the door, the door to the tabernacle. But before we get to that, we're going to just do a brief recap. And the first part of the recap is that um, the tabernacle, as you know, was ordered um, by God and not by man and is a replica of the pattern that is in heaven. There's a tabernacle in heaven, which God, when he gave the pattern to Moses, he firmly exhorted Moses to stay true to the pattern and this was built so God could again have and enjoy sweet fellowship with his creation, mankind. Amen? Yes. Okay, so we then learnt that every section of the tabernacle represented the, um, the Godhead. So we had the outside of the, tabern uh, of the tabernacle, the, the whole thing, the outer court, which represents the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we go into the holy place or the tent of meeting. And in there, that particular section of the holy place represents Holy Spirit. And in the holy of holies or the holiest place represents God the Father. So the whole Godhead is in this tabernacle. Okay, so the other thing is about this, we've been learning about the various uh, pieces of furniture. We learnt about the, the gates of going in, and then we learnt all about the different furnitures. I'm mostly ahead of myself. But all of this furniture had symbolism and it also had purpose. And these all pointed forward to the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we go to the next slide, please, Leanne, and we can see again that God had the 12 tribes of Israel <coughs> in such a way that the cross of Christ was formed. And the centerpiece of the cross was where the tabernacle was to be erected. Making the point to everybody, both then and looking forward into the, the New Testament believers' time, was that the whole centre point of life for the believer was, was to be a place of worship. And this is what the tabernacle was built for, a place of worship. There is also to be, as the individual believer, it's also from that place of worship, all things good flow as we worship the true and living God. If we can go to slide three now, the last, the very first um, part of the of the of the lessons was the gates. We started to learn about the gates of the tabernacle, and you can see there how beautifully embroidered they were. And um, it was through the gate that you entered in to the tabernacle. Again. The, the gates were pointing forward to the coming Messiah's life on earth and he himself, as we know in scripture, he declared himself to be the gate. We go to the next slide. We learn about the brazen altar after that, the place of the blood sacrifice. We learn that the brazen altar <coughs> represented the cross of Calvary, which is our brazen altar. We learned that the sacrifice upon the altar, in particular a lamb upon that, was a foretelling of Christ's coming as the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. And I think that's the second slide. Yeah, that's it. The two slides, yeah. And then we move to the next one, slide number six, which is what we focused on last week the brazen labour. We learnt that God appointed Aaron and his sons to the priesthood. They were nominated first to the priesthood. But first, Moses had to give them a head-to-toe washing, a full 
covering of water. But after this, Aaron and his sons were responsible then to wash their own hands and their feet. Moses did the initial one. Aaron and his sons, we learnt on, on slide number seven, was um, he was a type, or they were a type, of us, the New Testament believers. They were appointed to the office of priest. And just as Aaron and his sons were washed for consecration head to toe, this was pointing forward to the New Testament, to the believers' baptism. Have we got pictures up there? We go to the next one. Yeah. If we go there, this is pointing forward to the head to toe washing with the believers' baptism by full immersion. We learnt that baptism is not an option but an actual command of the Lord Jesus Christ. And also, this was reiterated by the apostles themselves that all believers to be baptized as congregation as a consecration to our own ministry. After the consecration of a full washing, Aaron and his sons were then responsible to wash their own hands and their own feet from here on in. This again is pointing forward to New Testament believers a daily washing in the Word of God. We wash ourselves daily by being in the Word. So now we move to slide eight. We next move to the next point after the brazen labor. And this is the door to the tent of meeting. So there's the door, similar colors as in the gate, the blues, the scarlets, um, I think purple, and also white. So if you want to turn to Exodus 26 and, sorry, yes, 26 and verse 36, this is what the scripture says there. This is God speaking. You shall make a hanging for the door of the tabernacle, woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen made by a weaver. And you shall make for the screen five pillars of acacia wood, and overlay them with gold. Their hook shall be gold, and you shall cast five sockets of bronze for them. And so I just want you to remember about the pillars because I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to mention about them until later later in the uh, ministry today. But just keep the thought keep the thought of the of the five pillars that made up the door to the tent of meeting. The door was also had a number of names in scripture, including the hanging for the door, the hanging, the hanging of the tabernacle door, and the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. This door was the entrance into the holy place. And the measurement of the holy place was 10 cubits by 10 cubits by 20 cubits, which turns in a total to be 2,000 cubits. Kevin Connor, the international Bible teacher, says this in his book on the Tabernacle of Moses. He's, he said, this is again a pointing forward to the entirety of the church age, which would commence on the day of Pentecost, and finished 2,000 years later. So that's about AD 29. So we are at the end of the age because this is AD 2024. You can see the correlation between the 2,000 cubits and the 2,000 years of the church age, which is drawing quickly to a close. We know that sometime soon the church age will finish. It's very soon. And as we know, as the gate was the <coughs> only way in to the outer court, <coughs> this door here, this door here, was the only way in to the holy place. But just as Jesus said that he was the gate, he again said in John 10 and verses 1 to 9, this is what he says if you want to 
turn there. But he says, I assure you, I most solemnly say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other place on the stone wall, that one is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep, the protector and provider. The doorkeeper opens for this man, and the sheep hear his voice and pay attention to it. And knowing that they listen, he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out to pasture. When he has brought all his own sheep outside, he walks on ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice and recognize his call. They will never follow a stranger, but will run away from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was talking about, scripture says. So Jesus said again, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, I am the door for the sheep leading to life. All who come before me as false, as false messiahs and self-appointed leaders are thieves and robbers, but the true sheep um, did not hear them. And he says again in verse 9, I am the door. Anyone who enters through me will um, be saved and will live forever and will go in and out freely and find pasture, spiritual security. Isn't that wonderful? The Lord Jesus often spoke in parables, didn't he, through the scriptures, in order that people would ask more questions and query him more. He loved that. He absolutely loved it when he worked, walked on the earth. And we can see here that he uses the word door twice in these verses. And that is to um, remind us that there is a right way in and there is a wrong way in, which he describes in verse 1b. There is a right way in to the holy place and there's a right way in to the holy of holies. Just as there was a right way into the outer court, there is a right, right way. There's a right way in. Only the Lord Jesus Christ, who is, is the only one who can lead us. And therefore, the right way in for us is in submission to all his commands. All the commands that he tells us in the scriptures in the New Testament. That is our right way in. In verse 7 and 9, the Lord Jesus really makes this scripture plain. He's really, they weren't getting it, and so he's really making it plain to them. And he identifies himself as the door on two occasions in verses 7 and 9. He said, I am the door for the sheep leading to life. There's no other way. And again in verse 9, I am the door. Anyone who enters through me will be saved and will live forever and will go in and out freely and find pasture, spiritual security. Is that what we want? Yes. Do we want spiritual security? If we're born again here today, we should have that assurance that we are saved and we will spend eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ, with the entire Godhead. <coughs> But there's the right way in. And the right way in is through submission to the Lord Jesus Christ's commands in the New Testament. When the Lord Jesus Christ came to earth, he met with people from all kinds of different classes and backgrounds and ethnicity. But as he said in Matthew 15 and verse 24, he said, I was commanded by God and sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
When he came to earth, this is who he was to minister to. He was commissioned by God himself and said, I'll lead to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When Jesus spoke to the children of Israel, I just love this. I just love this so much. He was not speaking something that was way out there, something totally quirky, something that they'd never heard of before. The children of Israel knew what he was talking about when he said he was the gate. They knew what he was talking about when he said he was the door. It wasn't way out there that they didn't understand. He spoke to them in language that they knew. And this is the great missionary, the great apostle, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is how you meet people where they're at. He knew his commission. The children of Israel, you know, up to this point, were going to temple once a year on the Day of Atonement. Or throughout the year they would be going to synagogue. And previous to the temples, there was the tabernacle. And we know that the last resting place of the tabernacle was in Shiloh. And then, you know, we remember, we remember Hannah as she cried out for a son. She wanted to have a child. She'd been barren, or she appeared to be barren. But she cried out for a son. Well, she did that in the old tabernacle. She did that. The last resting place at Shiloh. And nine months later, she gave birth to the great prophet Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 1. The children of Israel were not unfamiliar with the terminology that the Lord Jesus Christ was using. They would have understood the concept of the door when he explained it to them. Jesus was again reiterating to them that the only way of salvation. He is the only way of salvation. And he is the only way into the Christian life. And when we truly know him, we his sheep hear his voice. And we follow him all the way into eternal life through submission to his commands. Again, International Bible teacher Kevin Connor says this in his book on the tabernacle of Moses. This is his quote. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one and only way to God and the, into his church. The church is the place of priestly ministry for we that are in Christ are made kings and priests unto God. I have to read that again. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one and only way to God. He's the door. And into his church into the church, you've got to go through the door. The church is the place of priestly ministry. We take up our ministry, we've been nominated as soon as we're born again, but we need to move into that place where we are operating as the priests. This is our priestly ministry. For we are that in Christ and made kings and priests unto our God. He goes on to say that the believer has access as a king priest to offer up spiritual sacrifices in the spiritual priesthood in a spiritual house. We have access as king priests to offer up spiritual sacrifices in the spiritual priesthood in a spiritual house. The door in the tabernacle or church in the wilderness was pointing forward to the birth of the church on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit would come and ignite the New Testament believer with power and with revelation. God himself lit the New Testament candlestick, the church, the city on the hill. Jesus set every believer on fire the day that you have your own Pentecost you are set on fire but the ultimate setting on fire as God lit the menorah in the tent of meeting uh, on the first one it was divinely lit so too he lit the church the city on the hill and at the outset of the church age the 120 
were baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues and they went out and evangelized all the known world that were there in Pentecost. So what was Jesus saying? To know this, what he was saying here, that we need to look back again at the tabernacle in the wilderness. We look back at the door to the tent of meeting. But he, Christ Jesus, is the human manifestation of that door in the tabernacle. So what was Jesus offering us as New Testament priests? He was offering us what was on the other side of that door. So what's on the other side of the door? Let's see. Can we go to the next? Um, <coughs> we've gone to one. We need to go back. No, next one. This one. This is like... Here you can see all that was on the other side of the door. You can see the altar, the golden altar of incense. You can see the golden candlestick. And you can see um, the table of children. They're all there. So if we can, um, this is on the other side of the door. So these three pieces of furniture, they all have their own symbolism and their own utility. Their utility then, and then they have their symbolism for the New Testament believer. And all of them either com um, made completely of gold or overlaid with gold. And if we investigate further, we come to know what he was offering us from the time of the birth of the church age to the end of the church age, which is coming up very soon. He was offering us all what these pieces of furniture hold for us as priests of the Most High God. So, if we go over to the next slide, please. And the tabernacle in the wilderness, darling, we've gone too far, go again. Can we go back? Yeah, we'll just stay there on that one for the time being. So that is the altar of incense that um, the priest is ministering at. The place that um, they burnt the incense on. In Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25, this is what the scripture says. Therefore, he is able to save forever, completely, perfectly, for eternity. Those who come to God through him since he always lives to intercede and intervene on their behalf with God. Wasn't that wonderful? Yeah. Yeah. He is able also to save us forever, completely, perfectly, for eternity. Those who come to God through him, since he always lives to intercede and intervene on our behalf with God. Isn't that wonderful? It's yeah. so good, isn't it? Here we see that, that us coming through the door of the Lord Jesus Christ, believers are able to be saved completely, perfectly, and for all eternity. This is our God. He is the door. He is the door. Those who come through to God through the door of the Lord Jesus Christ have the assurance that he is interceding in prayer on our behalf and is also intervening for us before God on our behalf. You know, when we sin, willfully do something against the commands, or we trespass, we go into territory that God never asked us to go in, we can by the grace of God, repent and apologize to God and the Holy Spirit will empower us to not go there again. But Jesus does something as well. This is his intercession before the throne. When we sin or trespass, he intercedes on our behalf and he says to the Father, behold my blood. My blood upon the brazen altar, the cross of Calvary, I died for that one. Sure. This is his intercession. 
This is his intercession on the believer's behalf. He has wrought a great salvation that Jesus Christ, he did this for us on our behalf. So Christ Jesus' intercession and intervention is on the other side of that door, isn't it? He is our intercessor. On slide 10, if we go to that one now, please, Toby, that would be great. Get the, get the right one. Yep, this is it. So on the south side of, of the um, holy place, is the candlestick, the temple, uh, sorry, the tabernacle menorah, you know, um, the lampstand. And this candlestick or tabernacle menorah consisted of seven oil fed lights. God lit the, the light originally. But this light illuminated the holy place. This then was pointing forward to the coming of the Messiah. He would be the New Testament believer's golden lampstand. For we know he said this in, this, in John chapter 8 and verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is our golden lampstand. But he also said this, in uh, Matthew 5, 14 to 16. He said this about us, the New Testament priests. He said, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a wall. Instead, this, um, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and praise your Father in heaven. Isn't that good? Jesus said, I really like this. Jesus said, that they may see your good works. Let your light shine before men so that the world can see our good works. You know, oftentimes we think, oh, we don't do anything publicly. No. Here's Jesus saying, display your good works before men. Because we are the light of the world. He has given us what he has. He has given to us. We are the city on a hill <coughs> that cannot be, be um, hidden. We are filled with his light as individuals and the church itself becomes the light, the lampstand to the world, the golden candlestick. I think this is just so incredible. All of this is pointing forward to the New Testament church that as the menorah in the tabernacle was divinely lit by God himself, to light the tent of meeting, so to the church itself would be divinely lit by God on the day of Pentecost. And that was when the 120 were gathered in the upper room of the Lord <coughs> mentioned. But like Jesus, we are to be shedders of his glorious light within us. The church in the New Testament, and the, or the, the church in the New Testament, the candlestick or the tabernacle menorah, and we too, the individual believers, are set alight by the Lord Jesus Christ to emanate his glorious revelation and his goodness. This is our purpose. This is our purpose. If we go to slide 11, please, Toby. So... The next piece of furniture, or the final piece of furniture in the tent of meeting, is the table of showbread. And this was situated on the north side when they were camped of the tent of meeting. And the table had 12 loaves of bread placed upon it, each loaf representing one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And But the thing is, right, only the priests could partake of that bread. Not everybody else, only the priests. <coughs> so the table 
and a showbread could only be partaken of by the priest. So you bring that forward, that symbolism forward, and that Lord Jesus Christ is saying, he is the bread of life. And he says in the scriptures, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And then ever believers, whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So we see here that only the priests could partake in the Old Testament of that bread, bringing it forward that bread is ours as priests of the Most High God, as New Testament priests. The table of shoe bread represented the Lord Jesus Christ and pointed to his ability to satisfy uh, the thirsty and hungry soul. So the scripture says, whoever seeks me will find me if they seek for me with all, my, with all their hearts. And the believer who trusts in him alone. So all these pieces of furniture pointed forward to the life of Christ and all that he would fulfill on behalf of the believers. This is what was waiting the priests on the other side of the door. The door that is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is the way the truth and the life. He is the door of opportunity for everyone who would believe on him. He is the door of opportunity of all that would step through the door to take up their office as priest. Priests, New Testament priests. Jesus is the door to the holy place. He would bring for us reassurance at, the, at Calvary's cross as he intercedes and intervenes on our behalf. This is what he does on our behalf. I don't know if I've got to up some slide 11. Yeah, we do that, that's great. So, when he intercedes on our behalf, we too inherit that intercessory place. We are called to be intercessors and we intercede on behalf of others, with ourselves, or on behalf of others, just as Jesus intercedes for us. This is our ministry as well. The other side of that door brought um, enlightenment to the believer where there was darkness. He would bring light and illumination to where we have little understanding. Indeed, he would set us alight to minister to the unsaved and unbelieving. <coughs> we are the light set alight through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and his giftings to show that our God is very much alive and still at his work. Christ Jesus is our golden lampstand or candlestick. Through the door of the Lord Jesus Christ, we would enjoy sweet fellowship with him. His table of showbread pointed forward to who he is as the bread of life. The bread of life that came down from heaven from our most high and holy God and Father. All of this is ours in Christ Jesus, our Lord. As his New Testament priest, he equips us with his prayers of intercession as we are made in his image, emulate him as the intercessor. That's our job. We emulate him as the intercessor. He is our candlestick, is our enlightenment. He is our enlightenment in a dark world. But we are promised by him that we will not walk in darkness. He will make things known to us. And we are equipped with the ability to fellowship with him daily if we want to, hourly if we want to. We are able to dialogue with the Most High God and receive instruction from him. This is our privilege as New Testament priests of the Most High God, isn't it? Mm. And remember the five pillars. Here's our door into the holy place. 
as priests, it's through the door of the Lord Jesus Christ. He offers us a great equipping, and like the five pillars of the door to the tent of meeting, he places the offices, the offices of the gift men and women, apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists. This is what those five five offices <coughs> represent. They are the way in to the holy place. Through one of these ministries is generally how people are saved.
we recognise that walking through this door takes us all to new levels in you, as you reveal to us all that you have done for all men everywhere, to live a new life. And dear Lord, today we just declare afresh that we have walked through you the door to everlasting life. And we take hold of your enlightenment, your intercession and your wonderful fellowship with us, your children. In your name we pray. Amen.